Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Ari Brower. Ari is a researcher in the field of psychedelics who's currently working towards his PhD. In 2020, he published a paper in the Journal of Psychopharmacology with Dr. Robin Carhart Harris of the Imperial Center for Psychedelic Research, which introduced the concept of the pivotal mental state. This paper offered a way of thinking about many different types of transformative experience, including spiritual experiences attained by religious ascetics, those achieved through the consumption of psychedelics, and even states of psychosis. Today, we talk about the idea of the pivotal mental state and discuss its many interesting implications. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Ari Brower. Ari, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks, James, for having me. Yeah, it's great. Um, so maybe we can begin with a bit about your, your background, how you came to work in the, the field of psychedelics. Sure. Um, so I studied uh, neuroscience and religious studies undergrad and in that time period really became interested in the intersections between psychedelics, um, spiritual experience and psychosis and got very into ideas surrounding that. And um, instead of pursuing kind of a normal research trajectory, studying methamphetamine in mice or something in my small liberal arts school, I focused on these theoretical ideas regarding those interests and uh, haven't been able to shake them since. And so I've then pursued those interests at Boston University School of Theology that had a religion and science program for a while. And I was going to continue doing a PhD there, but the program got canceled as I was, as I was planning on moving into it. Right. And um, I had the fortunate you know, opportunity. I sent my master's thesis to um, Robin Carhart Harris said, Hey, I don't know if I'm going to be able to continue doing these ideas. I might need to get a job teaching high school or something, but you might be interested. You might be able to use these ideas. Uh, he offered to help me publish them and uh, really provided me the opportunity to now continue working in this space, um, which is, which, so I'm very thankful for him for that. And uh, that's, um, that's how I'm here. That's how I guess the paper that we'll be talking about today got published. And yeah, and I'm on route to, uh, I guess I just got accepted into a PhD program here at University of Wisconsin, Madison, and I'll be continuing to work on um, psychedelic research here in the future. So, yeah. right, yeah. So you, uh, you mentioned um, at the end of last year you you read this very published this very interesting paper um, with Robin on uh, this thing you termed pivotal mental states. Um, mm -hmm. Very interesting kind of construct. It helps to kind of make sense of a few different things that are at play here. Um, maybe we could just dive straight in with a bit of a definition of, of what pivotal mental states are. Sure. So I think it's important to realize this is a, this is a broad construct and, and somewhat vague definition on purpose, just so it can encapsulate all the things we're trying to talk about. So we define a pivotal mental state as a, a state of increased neuroplasticity, uh, increased associative learning, uh, which includes unlearning in our perspective, and then an enhanced capacity to mediate psychological transformation. So with the neuroplasticity and the increased associative learning, you have an opportunity to form new beliefs or revise old beliefs, but you're not necessarily going to see that happen. You could just have an odd kind of psychedelic-like experience and, and not your behavior or profile might not change from that. We allow that to be a potential outcome of a pivotal mental state. Other potential outcomes might be a spiritual experience that leads to enduring psychological well-being and a changed behavioral profile towards spiritual pursuits, or um, a psychotic experience that could lead to um, psychotic disorder and kind of behavioral correlates of that. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the the trade-off here, right? You said it's a kind of vague concept, but I mean, I think that's why it's quite kind of cool is yeah, that you can you can have this idea of a pivotal mental state, and from that you can you can get insight into the commonalities between psychosis, you know, psychedelic experience, religious experience, um, and I, I think that it's kind of interesting. You reflect on in your paper the kind of uh, different the different ways these like, kind of trajectories can manifest. For example, like with psychosis, there can be if there's a kind of negative context, there can be a kind of almost like a negative feedback loop of like increased distress. Um, and I guess context is a really important thing here, right? That kind of in part determines which of these is gonna happen. Absolutely. It kind of reinforces the, you know, the idea that is kind of carried through psychedelic science of the importance of set and setting in context. And um, certainly if you're entering into a, a, a psychedelic state or an endogenous psychedelic state, a pivotal mental state, 
Um, if you're around people you perceive to be threatening um, and you're unsure of yourself and you're feeling anxious, the likelihood of a, a negative experience, and it doesn't have to mean that that's going to turn into a psychotic disorder. It could just be a transient negative experience. Um, whereas if you're around, you know, people you trust out in nature in a lovely environment, feeling rather safe and secure, the, the likelihood of a positive experience will be, will be much higher. Um, right. And I think there's, you know, dimensions of intention and willingness to undergo this experience are also important. So I mean, when people take psychedelics recreationally or in clinical context, they're generally signing up for the experience, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas uh, psychosis, not so much all the time. Uh, right. Yeah. I think the, um, the use of the term context, it's kind of nice how I like how, how flexibly it's used. So like, you know, we could talk about context. It might evoke images of, as you say, like you're, you've taken a psychedelic. Are you in the context of a nice, comfortable therapist room with someone you're familiar with feeling very safe, you know, it's a classic kind of setting, part of setting setting, or are you in a kind of, I don't know, a party with people you don't know who feel threatening. And then that's more likely to push you into a kind of negative experience. But you also seem to kind of use context in this, I think a really helpfully broad way where, you know, the, the model is, is, it's not just psychological, it goes from to kind of like whole brain dynamics down to molecular level of different, you know, things like serotonin or psychedelics. So it has this lovely multi-level aspect. And then if you use the term context with all those different levels, you've got not just my immediate context here, it could be my context of my past, which you map onto kind of like the set, like the mental set of set and setting, um, or, you know, even you know, you, I think you describe this almost as like a limitation that it, you're not talking as much about genetics and childhood trauma and stuff. But I think that, you know, that could absolutely be understood, right, as a kind of deep context, like deep past of what you are and your neurochemistry as a kind of another kind of context. Yeah, absolutely. We use the term in the broadest possible sense because we, we acknowledge, um, obviously, there's there's a genetic predisposition towards psychosis. And for that matter, probably spiritual experience, um, given that they're phenomenologically related. Um, and that's important to include in context because, you know, the genetics alone might not influence, a, you know, they might influence a person's mind state, but it's the genetics plus, you know, the environment that's really, when you're looking at behavior, that's what you're seeing is those interactions. It's quite difficult to tease that apart actually. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, your, your, the paper's a really nice resource as well for, because uh, it, it cites so many different um, studies that look at these kind of genetic link, you know, the, uh, via serotonin to a receptor function to all of these different things. So just as a kind of recap for anyone um, you know, the serotonin 2A receptor is the main receptor that psychedelics seem to have their kind of psychedelic effects on. If you block it, uh, it doesn't, you know, you don't hallucinate, you don't trip. Um, but then you kind of cite evidence that variation, genetic variations between individuals in, in how that receptor gets kind of effectively made by the genes um, are linked to things like, you know, you just mentioned that there could be a, a kind of genetic component for just spirituality, right? And um, there's a bit of you kind of citing evidence on uh, kind of schizotypal um, and spiritual personality types being linked to variations in the serotonin 2A receptor, um, which is really kind of interesting idea that, they, that yeah, that, that it could even be playing out at that genetic level. Absolutely. And, and there it get, does get tricky because um, I think with, with schizophrenia in particular, there's, there's not definitive um, association between schizophrenia and a variation of the uh, serotonin right. 2A receptor polymorphisms, um, except maybe in certain ethnic populations. And then you got, you know, that's, that's difficult to tease apart. There, there does seem to be a link between trait absorption and a variant of the, of, of the serotonin 2A receptor and, um, perhaps even a slower experience of time. So subjective time dilation and a variant of, so, so absolutely. And, um, those, the, the paper is chock full of some of that, uh, we, we actually avoided going too deeply into the, um, at least in terms of psychosis and um, genetic variants, just because it's such a muddy um, right. kind of field, I guess you could call it right now.
Yeah, there's, it's yeah, it's cool idea that this this particular serotonin pathway in the brain could uh, be mediating, you know, as you say, kind of absorption and time dilation. You know, these these flow states where you can have these kind of transcendent spiritual experiences of of timelessness that are common to everything from yeah psychedelic experiences to near death experiences, to kind of mystical experiences. Absolutely. So that's nice that you're you're kind of channeling all this into this one um, particular pathway in the brain, right? Um, and maybe yeah. we should, um, so with the actual idea, you know, at, at the front, you're kind of saying that, um, not to put words in your mouth, but, um, that this pivotal mental state is, you know, it can go positively or negatively, right. It could become psychosis or it could become spirit, kind of a spiritual experience, which is a real kind of reframing from how this stuff, I think, tends to be seen, right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, um, we, we allow for the pivotal mental state to be outcome neutral in the paper because we want it to be a vague and, and, and broad construct. Um, but that's not to say that you can't, you couldn't look at an individual trajectory and say, that person really looks like they're on route towards a psychosis or that person really looks, if I had to guess, you know, they're on a healthy spiritual quest and um, they're the types of experiences they're describing seem pretty beneficial and benign. Um, so in individual cases, you might be able to distinguish, but also um, in terms of when you think about the diagnostic criteria for a psychotic disorder or what's considered a spiritual experience, we, we label them in retrospect based on the fruits of the experience. So um, someone could be having hallucinatory phenomenon, uh, alterations in sense of self, um, ego dissolution of various sorts, magical thinking, you know, belief in prayer or karma or belief that my mind can change reality and vice versa, that other minds can influence my mind or behavior. And it's sometimes in the beginning, it's hard to say exactly where these states of mind are going to lead. But in retrospect, we can look at someone and say, wow, look at how dysfunctional that person's become clearly a psychotic state or in retrospect, that was a harrowing spiritual kind of crisis, but they came out of it for the better, right? Um, and we might label that as, so, so part of our labels actually in terms of the transformations are, are, are based on the functional outcomes. And that's one reason why we kind of like our pivotal mental state construct because we're, we're, we're trying to look at the state that can produce divergent outcomes. Right, yeah, and I think this is something I, I really enjoyed in reading your work was the feeling that I was, I was um, reading ideas that uh, kind of had come to, come to me or that I'd read elsewhere in a way that was being presented in a very kind of rigorous scientific way. So, um, you know, like Joseph Campbell was kind of this quote about the, um, the psychotic drowning in the same waters that the mystic swims in with delight or something to that effect. That felt very much like you know you're but you're describing it in terms of you know rigorous psychological and neurobiological um terms this it feels to me like the same phenomena do you do you recognize that as the kind of same phenomenon um in terms of the connection between what we're saying and joseph yeah. campbell's yeah ab absolutely and i think i i i think that's where maybe some of the interest in this piece does come from is it really is a rehashing of ideas that have been there for a long time and and phenomenologically people have known forever spiritual experiences and psychosis phenomenologically very very related people have related shamanic um, phenotypes to psychotic phenotypes um, for a long time and and so phenomenologically we we know they're related and then kind of getting in into maybe the neural mechanisms of how they're actually um, related and uh, yeah, I mean, I think there there are perhaps some some differences that you can notice going into a, a pivotal mental state or even in the incipient phases. Um, and often those revolve around uh, emotionality and um, interpersonal functioning. So if you look at schizotypy as a construct, which is like, could be viewed as like a personality trait that that is related to schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Um, so a large aspect of schizotypy is, is really just map measuring psychotic like thinking. So perceptual aberrations, 
uh, magical thinking, disorganized thought and speech, which means loose connections between ideas, being able to bounce from ideas to ideas. Um, whereas the other aspect of schizotypy is really about kind of negative emotions and interpersonal deficits. So suspiciousness, not having close friends, really odd, out of place behavior. And the spirituality piece has those psychotic like features of schizotypy, the uh, unusual perceptual experiences, the magical thinking. Um, but it doesn't, you don't see those interpersonal deficits or, or, or suspiciousness as kind of like suspiciousness, anger, hostility as, as a, like a defining um, emotional tone. You would actually see probably like an enhanced sense of connectedness with the world, maybe an enhanced empathy or trust with others. So I think those are important, um, yeah. maybe distinctions. And is it maybe, do you think the, the kind of the context during the experience that is the main thing that determines that? Like, you know, if you're, if you're intentionally in the wilderness trying to have a spiritual experience and it happens, then it's a very positive thing that you're in control of versus if you know if you're experiencing trauma after trauma and you have no social support then you're going to kind of spin out into psychosis absolutely and i think um so isolation if, if you're willingly isolating yourself in the woods um that can be quite an enjoyable experience whereas if you feel like you're being ostracized or persecuted um by others uh it's it's much more likely to be a negative experience and and predispose you to sort of psychosis and and there's pretty good evidence now that um, like rates of psychosis um, it, 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 amongst African Americans in the U.S. or darker skinned immigrants in Europe are quite a bit higher than um, kind of white native populations. And 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 there could be multiple factors going into this, but discrimination, persecution, uh, what we could all be framed under the label of social defeat um likely contribute to the development of psychotic disorders and there's a whole social defeat hypothesis of um schizophrenia that goes into that and that's in our paper but yeah. um whereas intentionally you know isolating yourself or or for that matter intentionally starving yourself or intentionally um inducing pain for the sake of ritual these are the intention it's the intentional use of stress to hijack a system um, for promoting transformation. And I think that's, that to me is probably the most interesting aspect of the whole piece. And maybe for your listeners too, because it's, I, there's a lot of interest in the, um, psychedelic underpinnings of religion, um, kind of broadly, because you notice such a phenomenological similarity between the psychedelic state and religious texts or, you know, descriptions of religious experiences. Whereas, um, this piece gives us an explanation where it doesn't necessarily just have to be the psychedelics. It can be, you know, ascetic practices inducing psychedelic like states. So why do all cultures across the world fast and uh, uh, isolate them? Like why do all these religious exemplars from different traditions isolate themselves? Um, it, it, it's probably, there's probably a, um, this stress-induced psychedelic-like signaling that explains the recurrence of these practices, I suspect. And that, and that broadens kind of, it, it broadens what, what we can view as like um, contributing to the psychedelic-like nature of, of religion, because it doesn't just have to be psychedelics now. It can be these practices that induce psychedelic-like signaling. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe if we start with, um, start unpacking, there's a lot of interesting stuff to unpack there. If we start with stress, um, which is a really kind of fundamental thing for us as these like living organisms that are trying to survive. Um, and so there's, there's different kind of ways of coping with stress, right? And some of them seem to be kind of linked to the serotonin system. Absolutely, yeah. So in a paper that uh, Dr. Carhart Harris wrote before me, he kind of, it's called A Tale of Two Receptors. And he says, you know, there's, there's two stress systems. One's mediated by the 1A, the serotonin 1A receptor. And that promotes kind of a, a patient waiting or enduring of stress and kind of what we might associate with the learned helplessness of depression. You know, you're kind of just waiting through stress. And then this other serotonin receptor, the one we're talking about, the serotonin 2A receptor, promotes behavioral activation actually in response to stress. And 
Dr. Carl Harris in that piece suggests there's a there's a switch towards more two A receptor signaling uh, under conditions of chronic or intense stress, which which is an, an an effort to promote radical adaptation when other responses to stress aren't working, right? So it's it's not necessarily evolutionarily worth it for an organism to try and radically adapt its behavior or its way of perceiving the world if it's already working, right? Why would you change what's what's not broken? But if 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 the behavior is not adequate, then it might be worth risking something like a, a psychosis or or some kind of maladaptation. Um, in order to promote uh, in the off chance that you get a functional adaptation. So yeah. I think this this came to mind when you were describing um, higher incidence of psychosis in, in communities that face kind of oppression, because I do think, um, you know, we, we all construct beliefs about the world to keep to kind of keep ourselves safe and regulate our emotional lives. And delusion, delusional thinking to me does seem to the idea that it is mediated through stress makes a lot of sense to me that like you're feeling unsafe and you you need to hold on to your beliefs incredibly tightly because because that makes you feel better it makes you feel safer and that could you know if things are stressful enough that could be pathological you it might not be beneficial in the long term but it could actually be 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 um helpful right if you're if you're really if you really think you know what's going on, that can be, I guess, a kind of self-soothing process. Yes, it, it could be enough. And if you look at maybe like uh, not full-blown delusions that most people consider pathological, but just us versus them thinking. So in terms of delusions, your two most common types in psychosis would, or actually there's, there's probably three very common types, which would be self-referential delusions in which you think everything relates to yourself, everything's a sign and message to yourself. Grandiose delusions where you might have a sense of significance or purpose, and then persecutory delusions where you think people are against you. And just those three features, if, if you have just thinking that's slightly delusional, you can develop strong us versus them mentalities that actually promote um, activism or like social engagement or, uh, um, kind of group bonding and, and uh, yeah. So you, you can see how at, you know, I, I don't think anyone's arguing that psychosis is, is functional in any way, but the reason it persists probably evolutionarily is, is psychotic like thinking in, in, in lesser degrees is, can be functional, especially under conditions of, of stress and persecution where, you know, maybe maybe it's maybe it's better to take a kind of hard line approach and s kind of simplify reality so you can act in reality. Yeah, I actually yeah. the other week happened to be thinking about a similar idea of um, a kind of spectrum from if you think of, of kind of meditative spiritual experience where often there's a feeling of kind of realizing you don't really know anything kind of letting go of all your concepts seeing seeing through them and thinking and kind of confronting a real kind of a, a mysteriousness to existence and being okay with that feeling positive with that that's a state of really letting go of all of your beliefs um and at the other extreme you might have something like you know i guess in extreme fascism or something where you see these these political ideologies often go along with invented narratives you know just person you know scapegoating narratives of, of people where they've just made something up kind of demonstrably but people believe it and it probably is serving some kind of um yeah some some process of making people feel better because they've they've managed to come up with some narrative that suits them rather than having to sit with whatever the ambient stress might be absolutely and i think um and this is this is kind of related to the piece that I'm working on now, but it, it 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 seems counterintuitive that you might have kind of extreme openness and like cognitive flexibility, like uh, in your meditative state where there's no judgments really, or or less judgments, um, and not a lot of ideological fixation, but how that actually might be related to subsequent ideological fixations. So if you look at something like uh, even something like the counterculture in the, in the 60s and early 70s, you have 
kind of this weird mixture of people who are just anything goes, you know, you know, values open, open to all types of things with, with kind of entrenched ideology as well. And, the, and these things mix. And uh, there's some psychological models of radicalization where, where you can get an opening up of the mind and opening up of possibilities and then a subsequent kind of contraction and fixation around a newfound identity. Um, because loosening beliefs um, provides grounds for forming alternative fixed beliefs. And, and you might actually, I've been reading and toying with the idea where the psychedelic state and, and dream states for that matter, by creating kind of the free association of information, um, it'll, it allows for generalizations across contexts, kind of um, associating information across contexts to form generalizations, which then can lead to a simpler kind of simpler schemas of the world, but um, can kind of create this, these ideological fixations where you can assemble information into these ideological frameworks. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think, I don't think those, it seems like they might be unrelated, but um, they actually might fit nicely together in, in some context. And I think you're you're interested in, in in Buddhism and contemplative traditions. And I think in those traditions, there's a real emphasis on trying to maintain the plastic state, right? Not if you're opening the mind up, not to subsequently fall into the ideological right. fixations that are that are actually a danger when you're opening the mind up like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's. Um... Yeah, I, I I really advocate for a combination, I guess, of of um, staying in touch with that open kind of meditative state, combined with actively working on one's emotional health to reduce stress levels, so you don't need to hold on to stories as tight as tightly. And I think if you don't do those two things in an ongoing way, um, and instead say you have a big psychedelic experience, during that experience you may be you may feel enlightened and you may be letting go of all your stories and maybe very positive, but then you come back and it's, I've, you know, you see it again and again, it's very easy for someone to, they feel, I guess it's almost like a rebound where they need to have a story about it. And, you know, where it's like, okay, the universe is, is like this, or, you know, reality is like this and, and that's my story now and I'm sticking to it. I think that's, um, I can quite easily imagine the, yeah, the brain kind of needing to, or, naturally overcompensating for you know it's a moment of loss of control and it's like okay we now we really need to double down on the control um as a kind of compensatory reflex absolutely and i and i even wonder whether it's not a feature of the the classic psychedelic experience and maybe it would be worth comparing the classic psychedelic experience to the types of kind of mystical type experiences that might be induced by ketamine or something because um in the classic psychedelic experience, it seems like there's often this opening up and and kind of freedom at some point in the experience, and then at some point an insight might come along, and there's or or towards the end of experience there's a fixation on a certain idea that came about, and that fixation then carries through and and fascinates the person, and then there's the interpretation of the experience at afterwards, um, and and who knows what that might be related to uh, enduring dopaminergic signaling that kind of, you know, re, uh, kind of re ingrains, it kind of helps re ingrain ideas about the experience or yeah. Right. Um, but it's, it's almost a, it's almost seems to be a feature of the experience itself. Um, yeah. yeah. So on, on the, um, the idea of the serotonin system and, and stress, you know, you were saying how they these kind of subsections that may, you know the 1a system may be involved in kind of in coping kind of persevering and then the 2a psychedelic system might be involved in more this kind of pims type radical um change there's you know i guess most people's idea of what serotonin is is this very this kind of old story i guess in the 70s i think of like it, it's basically the happy chemical it's the mood chemical um right which comes from this simple story of it seems that classics, you know, serot um, serotonergic antidepressants, increased serotonin activity. So maybe depression is a deficit of serotonin, which we, you know, seems to be a consensus that that kind of isn't really what's going on. Um, but yeah, this idea that there seems to be a lot of evidence, right, that the serotonin system is really involved with stress. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think if you look at 
granted, a lot of systems are involved with stress. Try and find a neurotransmitter system that you can say is involved with stress, but particularly the, the serotonin system, I think. And um, so, you know, any any type of uh, physical, mechanical stress, heat stress, serotonin system modulates, social stress um, is a big one. Uh, so, so, so clearly different responses to stress. Um, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, you do get a, you do definitely get a different phenomenological profile when you just release a bunch of serotonin in the brain, for instance, via MDMA or something, than when you just hit the two A receptors, uh, certainly. And what might be happening in, in terms of spiritual experience or, or psychosis, either you have a, you might have a down regulation of the 1A receptor and an up regulate relative up regulation of the 2A receptor, or you could just have targeted um, uh, activation of, of 2A receptors through the release of neurotransmitter or something. So there's various ways um, that you can get a preferential activation of, of the 2A receptor. Right. Yeah. And I mean, so again, for, for anyone who's um, not familiar with how this stuff works, so you've got neurons and they've got these receptors on them and the serotonin kind of connects to it and then activates a series of processes in, in the neurons. Right. And so one thing you can have is, is different expression of the neurons between people because of their genetics. And again, in the paper, you cite some interesting studies looking at how certain genes are associated with the genes that produce the um, serotonin 2A receptor are related to anxiety and different kind of um, and PTSD as well. So there seems to be this link to stress there, but then also, um, you know, the changes in the, just how many of these are produced over time in different individuals, uh, the kind of expression level, depending on things like psychosis. Um, and there was a really sure. interesting bit where, so you, you talk about, you know, the kind of the recent context, the kind of stress, the chronic stress building up, and then a kind of an acute stress event producing these, these pivotal mental states. Um, and then kind of parallel it with the idea that maybe there's a kind of background change in the expression level that you're kind of building up the number of these serotonin 2A receptors. And then when the stressful event happens, there's a kind of burst of serotonin activity and that's the kind of mechanism that triggers the, the pivotal mental state. Is that a fair representation? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we mentioned that, I think, I think there's pro there's probably a variation to and exactly the dynamics of how these two A receptors can be activated, but let's take the example, for instance, of, of depressive phenotypes. So depression, um, a lot of studies have mentioned there might be increased, uh, serotonin, uh, two A receptor expression. So more proteins, more, more proteins of these serotonin two A receptors embedded in the membrane, ready to be activated by the serotonin or uh, possibly endogenous psychedelics. Um, and then, yeah, some, some stressful event happens. It, it could even be a good event. Like, you know, you're falling in love or you, you get really into work or something that it increases uh, excitatory neurotransmission and you have all, you have more receptors to be activated. Right. And then you can transition from this depressive type uh, profile to a psychotic type profile. And you definitely see this in, in um, Although it's, you know, I think there's a lot of overlap here between bipolar psychoses and, and uh, schizophrenia psychoses that I won't get into. But this, this transition from kind of a depressed like state to a hyperactivated um, psychotic like state. Um, right. And uh, yeah. So, so I, I'd say, yeah, that, 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 that model holds because in, in something like psychotic disorder, sometimes you actually see less, ex, less um, expression of the serotonin 2A receptors in a really florid psychosis. And that's difficult to interpret it, but it could be that they've been bombarded by so much serotonin that this is getting into neuroscience territory. I, I apologize if we're getting really into the weeds here, but that could, that could create an internalization and down regulation of, of the serotonin 2A receptors. So. Okay. So if we, um, so you've got this idea that you've got this system in the brain that's kind of evolved for rapid change. So you've got the first, the 1A system where you're, you're actively coping. And then um, is it, so would the idea be that, that when things have really got to a point where you're incredibly stressed or, you know, things are really going wrong, 
and you you need to suddenly learn you need to kind of turn about and, and kind of reconfigure your your perception of the world is that the kind of thing that would trigger the the uh, the pins or pivotal mental state sure and so i think it could be a chronic stress buildup or it could be intense transient stress so for instance in the near death experience um it, if a if a stressor is intense enough it will it can activate uh it, it can it can kind of induce a pims as well so i think the most one of the most likely times to have a near death experience is during cardiac arrest people coming out of cardiac arrest will report having a near death experience and um there's at least one paper that shows the likelihood of that is related to how much uh co2 you you have circulating in your body. Um, and, and there's other people that suggest, you know, serotonin uh, neurons in the brainstem are sensitive to um, CO2 in terms of they're chemosensitive to the pH of, of, of the body. And so that could be a mechanism to, to trigger a PIMS. Um, it seems like a, a, a lowering of the body's pH might, could, could be implicated in a lot of responses to stressors so you have that you, you could have that with start starvation you could have that with with insane exercise routines um or uh lack of oxygen um and these types of things now i, wish, I should mention that it might not all be the the serotonin to a receptor some of these stressors seem to um increase uh the um, circulation of NMDA receptor antagonists like kynorenic acid. And so there you go, there you could have, oh, you got a little bit of increased serotonin to a receptor activation and um, increased antagonism of this NMDA receptor, which kind of would mirror a ketamine like effect. And so you could see how those things would interact to produce, you know, more intense experiences. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, because as you say, the NMDA receptor is the main site of the ketamine axon, right? So um, that's right. a really interesting idea. So um, with, I guess, the idea of that this is evolutionarily beneficial and it's adaptive because there are circumstances where, you know, things go really wrong and, you, you, you know, you get something, you might have post-traumatic stress disorder from a really traumatic, stressful event, but you also might have post-traumatic growth, right, where you you need to learn because so, to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Absolutely. And you could, you could, you could view the, um, some, some, uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder as actually an adaptation in themselves. So for instance, an extreme response to a stimuli that is, that is threatening might be at, could in some ways be advantageous or, or, if, or, or, to a lesser degree, like a lesser response could be advantageous. So for instance, if, if I've come to be, I I'll use this example again, I used it recently, but um, if I like dogs and I'm normally just go up and pet dogs all the time, if, if one, if, if the next dog I go to pet tries to rip my throat out and it's almost successful doing that, it would be beneficial for me to radically adapt to, to radically adapt to that last dog and, and disproportionately learn from that experience just in the off chance that that's going to happen again. I wouldn't want to weight that experience equally to all my previous experiences of, of friendly dogs or else I, I'm going to lessen my chance of survival probably. And so you can see how you want to disproportionately learn from uh, very stressful experiences. And in that sense, a, a form of, a, a lesser form of, of traumatic response to stress might be beneficial. Right. Yeah. And I think this is a really crucial point because you know, we were talking earlier about <clears throat> the serotonin system may be, be involved in stress, but then you might say, well, why does serotonin 2A receptor activation with a psychedelic, why does it produce these like these kind of cathartic emotional release experiences and positive psychological transformation? Um, but here you're saying, well, you've got this system that evolved for these kinds of like snapshot, like we're gonna reconfigure everything. So at a physiological level, when you activate that receptor, you're, at, you're setting in motion all the processes that are necessary to increase plasticity between neurons, right, for learning. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you take a psychedelic, you're kind of artificially activating that same, that same system. And then as a result, you can have all these positive therapeutic effects that we see in the literature, right? Yep. 
Yep, that's uh, I would say that's a pretty good interpretation. Yeah. Right, and then you mentioned earlier that uh, something really interesting you write about is is the idea that religious kind of aesthetic practices might be another method to kind of intentionally try to activate this this system to produce kind of positive psychological change. Absolutely, yeah. So, I uh, most uh, modern religious traditions people fast. Um, intentional social isolation, at least some people will do that. Um, celibate, celibacy is interesting because it doesn't really fit into the mold very well, but if, if you wanted to get into the weeds and the serotonin system does regulate blood flow, <laughs> things related to, that might be related to sexual arousal and uh, celibacy and stuff. Um, uh, the intentional use of pain, especially in initiation rituals and ceremonies um, is used throughout cultures. Um, and, and, and shamanistic traditions that we wouldn't expect really to have that much cultural exchange, at least like recently still use the same practices. So you're going to see the same practices amongst, um, some tribes in South America or North America, as you do, uh, in kind of central Asia. And that really kind of points to, you know, other explanations of ascetic practices will be like, oh, there's some cultural reason that um people come to these practices perhaps but it's given the universality of these practices it's likely that there's a, a biological underpinning um and related to that um there's there's an overlap between anorexic and psychotic phenotypes and it seems that some people have a predisposition to react to starvation in a way that is actually like it, it induces pleasurable feelings um so it, it does seem that there's a uh and, and obviously sleep deprivation is one of the fastest ways into a manic state. So there's all these connections there. And um, it's also not just ascetic practices that um, kind of take advantage of this system to induce plasticity. Torture, torture would work in the same way. Uh, it's just, you're not willingly engaging with these stressors. Someone's imposing them upon you to try and uh, manipulate how your brain works. Um, and so, and, and it, and it, it kind of, it's another good example of how context will <clears throat> determine whether it's a positive experience or a negative experience because torture is not a positive experience. And you place someone in solitary confinement, they'll start to display symptoms of psychosis. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and you point to this combination of um, interrogation and torture techniques with LSD by the military um, to kind of, uh, you know, I guess produce states of psychological malleability or, or susceptibility, right? Which seems to be, it kind of fits with this. Yeah, it does. And I can't profess to know much about that. I'm not sure who does, but <laughs> um, certainly, certainly they, I mean, I think that a connection was recognized there, right? And right. so, yeah. Yeah, so you have, uh, yeah, social isolation is one stress that you mentioned, like kind of going off into the woods and or being in nature, which we you know see in lots of different religious traditions of people like Jesus and the Buddha. You, you know, you write about in the paper, um, and then celibacy, fasting, sleep restri restriction, and then I, it's I think also temperature change is interesting as well, right? That like you've got kind of sweat change. lodges and and also kind of cold water yeah. swimming and all these things seem to also produce these kinds of different or significant psychological changes in people. Absolutely, and um, my mentor right now, uh, Dr. Charles Raison here at, at, uh, at Madison, he's studied a lot of hyperthermia for depression. So yes. raising core body temperature will actually alleviate symptoms of depression. And it's, it's, it's related to an eventual anti-inflammatory response. And one of, the, one of the interesting aspects of psychedelics is they have this powerful anti-inflammatory response um, the 2A receptor also um, modulates temperature. For instance, you take psychedelics, your core temperature will raise. Um, and it, it seems like a lot of these stressors that we're talking about, especially like, I also mentioned exercise, extreme exercise routines and aesthetic practices and stuff. They have an antidepressant response and, you know, psychedelics have an, like a probably an inherently antidepressant response. And so, a lot of these um, 
kind of manipulations, alternative manipulations and treatments of depression might work on the same kind of stress increased psychedelic signaling pathway. Yeah, I'm actually really interested in the endurance um, aspect of it because in my 20s, I used to run ultra marathons. These were kind of ridiculously long races. And it, for me, it was explicitly linked to, you know, I would consider myself to be meditating during it. And it was, it was a, it, I found it to be an easier way into these states rather than sitting on a cushion. I thought if I, after you've run for a few hours, you 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 kind of have to struggle to not fall into a kind of flow state um, if you're committing to do that. And so it, that really resonated. And um, in the paper, actually, you mentioned something that, that I used to be fascinated by that I've actually not heard anyone else mention, um, but it's, it's this uh, thousand marathons in, in a thousand days of these Japanese Tendai Buddhist monks run as this kind of spiritual practice, which I yeah was interested to see referenced. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you have examples of these intense uh, physical endurance things, and certainly in the, in the sun dance of, of Native American Indians, you know, you're dancing around a pole without food or water sometimes for three days or something at a time. I mean, insane, insane physical um, feats to produce these experiences. And this is where the NMDA receptor antagonism might come in too, because um, I, I, I think exercise increases the kynorenic acid too. So there could be a NMDA receptor antagonism, kind of a ketamine-like effect going on with uh, runner's high, as well as potential um, um, uh, serotonergic mechanisms. I was reading an interesting paper recently about sheer stress, which is just the stress that comes from moving uh, your brain, your brain. Um, influencing expression of the 2A receptor. And it reminded me of all these religious practices in which people are like bobbing their heads or, or moving in these repetitive ways, right, um, to increase. So, you know, the, the connections here are potentially endless and some of them are probably not valid, but enough of them are that it's, you know, it's interesting to think about. Yeah, definitely. I, also, the um, sleep restriction point, um, Miles, you know, sleep deprivation in the short term, it also has antidepressant effects, right? And not in the long term. Absolutely, yeah. Interestingly, that can push you into psychosis in the long term as well, right? So that seems to fit with this as well. Absolutely. Uh, lack of sleep is good. If you start feeling too good for not sleeping for a long time, yeah, it's dangerous territory. Yeah, right. my uh, kind of my, uh, I've, I've had the runner's high before, so I, I have... I, I can relate to that. And uh, I also was driving across country from Utah back to Pennsylvania and probably hadn't slept really in two days and wasn't eating because I knew eating would make me tired. And coming over the mountains of Pittsburgh, you know, a couple hours until I reached my dis my destination, I, I, things were noticeably psychedelic like <laughs> in the phenomenology. And that was, that was food restriction and sleep deprivation. So uh yeah. I, I think a lot of people can probably relate to some of these, some of these things phenomenologically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a, for me, actually, the, probably the single event that led to me being here now having these kinds of conversations was in my early teens, I had a stress induced kind of spontaneous mystical experience, which was to do with um, kind of in it, the proximate cause was going to a Catholic school and dealing with all the stress of being told I was going to go to hell and that kind of stuff. Um, but then mm. long-term cause kind of emotional uh, kind of issues in, in kind of early childhood or that kind of stuff in the background. And then the, the relentless rumination led to a moment of just kind of, yeah, uh, my mind stopping and a, a moment of kind of radical psychological change. Um, and so, yeah, if, if anyone's going to agree with you, I think that stress can produce these very positive <laughs> experiences. It's going to be me. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, um, yeah, it's, it, when, you, when you look at religion broadly, the, the connection there and spiritual experience in particular, the connection there with stress is just so apparent. I mean, if, what are the goals of most religious tradition though? To, to reduce suffering, salvation? I mean, they're, these, are, these are explicitly things to kind of deal with existential stressors or, or in, uncontrollable stress, you know, the death of loved ones, things we just can't control and, and somehow coming to, to be okay with these things. And um, there's a good book, uh, The Spiritual Nature of Man by Alistair Hardy, in which he analyzes, I think it's maybe 3,000 self-reported uh, religious experiences. 
And so many of them are preceded by despair or illness or stress. He lists the triggering conditions and maybe half are related to some kind of stress. Um, so the link here is, is quite strong. Yeah, I think it's also makes me think how, I think for most of my life, I, I the word stress to me just evoked kind of like the, the feeling of, oh yeah, I had a stressful day at work with just this very mild thing that wasn't foundationally important. The way we're talking about stress, you know, I think stress is a, is a hugely foundational concept when you're trying to understand any kind of biological system. Um, the fact that it can push you into these like vastly altered states, you know, uh, just for anyone who thinks we're still talking about any kind of mild level of, of stress here, that this is a really fundamental aspect of being a living thing. Um, and so maybe next we can turn to, you know, you, you talk about the, the idea that psychosis could be one outcome and this ties in nicely with the psychotomimetic paradigm that people used to have for psychedelics when they thought, you know, the main thing they did was mimic psychosis. Um, but most of the literature tends to focus on the dopamine system for psychosis, right, rather than the serotonin system. It's not as simple, you know, again, the simple story of schizophrenia used to be it's just a dopamine disorder, but we now know it's far more complex than that. But there's, yeah, there's interesting, you talk about kind of a few different ways of thinking about the interaction between the serotonin and dopamine system in producing these states, right? Yes, yes, I'm glad you mentioned it. And uh, certainly, um, because of the nature of the paper, we're, we're focusing on ways where the, the 2A receptor might be more foundational to psychosis than we, than we might have thought otherwise. I think one of the, what, what captured my attention, at least in the kind of the final stages of, of our rewrite of our first draft, was recent studies that, have, that are showing, well, one recent study showed that dopamine in high concentrations can act as a partial agonist at the serotonin 2A receptor. So really high concentrations of dopamine in the brain might actually um, activate the serotonin 2A receptor, inducing psychedelic-like signaling. Um, chronic dopamine-enhancing drugs also can upregulate um, serotonin 2A receptor expression um, and sensitize uh, behavioral responses to, to psychedelics. All this is important because low doses of dopamine enhancing drugs don't produce noticeably um, psychedelic or psychotic -like phenomena. If you do a little bit of cocaine or if you do a little like a tidbit of amphetamine, most people aren't going to have a psychotic -like response to that. Where you get your dope, where you get your dopamine and do psychoses is it, is it kind of chronic in large doses of, um, of methamphetamine or, or other stimulants in, in Parkinson's disease, it would be, with kind of chronic treatment with L-DOPA, which is a dopamine precursor. And interestingly in Parkinson's disease, because people are getting this L-DOPA for their motor symptoms and they're having these visual hallucinate, they're having symptoms of um, psychosis, visual hallucinations and stuff because of the increased dopamine, um, actually antagonizing the serotonin 2A receptor will ameliorate some of these psychotic symptoms. So, so it's, it's interesting there you get, you know, you, some, some of the, some of the psychosis induced by dopamine probably um, is mediated by activation of the serotonin 2A receptor. Um, and I think more, we, more work will need to be done on that front to, to see there. Also, we should note that this activation of the serotonin 2A receptor modulates dopamine. So um, the stress induced release of dopamine uh, is partially modulated by activation of the serotonin 2A receptor. Uh, there's only a couple studies that have shown this, but if you, if you, um, you know, block the serotonin 2A receptor with cantancerin or another antagonist, you won't get the same dopamine response to a social stressor. So there's a lot of interactions here between dopamine and, you know, the receptor of interest. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess, you, you always talk about these two different pathways um, of how these things may interact. And so on the one hand you have, yeah. So if you're doing something like cocaine, that's, that's boosting um, dopamine and, you know, dopamine's, this is for the audience. I know you know this, um, but dopamine's to do with kind of reward. And then as a result, um, so yeah, with Parkinson's, because with reward, you need to go and seek it. It's, you know, you need to actually do movements. It's a lack of dopamine that produces the, 
the difficulty in moving right, in, in Parkinson's. So you have this dopamine supplement effectively that, that boosts dopamine levels, but if it goes too high, you can have psychotic symptoms. And then, as you said, there's a, uh, a pharmaceutical, right, that, that I think it blocks the serotonin 2A receptor in a way that kind of has the opposite effect where it kind of binds to it. Yeah, pim, that, pim vanserin. Right, yeah. yeah, so it kind of it has the opposite effect of a psychedelic physiologically, I guess, and that seems to help with with Parkinson's or with the psychosis produced by the excess dopamine. So there seems to be this this interaction, but then you also, I mean, most of the stuff we've been talking about, I guess, comes from the idea that it's the serotonin system is activated first, and then maybe there's a final common pathway, right, where the, the, the dopamine system is activated. Yes, and although I've been wondering recently if 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 we can't if we can't understand the common route towards psychosis, I, I would say in the and this is a this is a potential framework, but understanding the schizophrenia pathway to psychosis with initial you know, stress and activation of the serotonin 2A receptor, and then increasing engagement with the dopaminergic system. Whereas alternatively, you could have activation of the dopaminergic system, goal-driven behavior first, lack of sleep, mania, that then becomes psychotic, which could be actually activation of the dopaminergic system first, which then activates the, the 2A system. So it actually, this, this these kind of feedback systems between the serotonin and the dopamine system, and obviously glutamate is implicated everywhere here. Uh, we can't leave, you know, we can't say these are the only systems involved in um, psychosis, but it could help explain how you can, you can actually get to psychosis from like almost opposite behavioral, um, profiles where like a depressed kind of disengaged schizotypal profile or like a really excited manic, uh, kind of goal driven profile. Yeah. It was interesting where you made a connection, the paper between that, that kind of, um, the, the, depressive symptoms leading up to schizophrenia with a kind of the start of a spiritual quest. You made a kind of parallel there, right? Yep. Oh, the, um, yeah, the prodromal features of, of psychosis, um, especially, so the prodrome is a period of, of months to, to years that precedes um, a psychotic episode, but in retrospect, especially becomes noticeable where, where someone disengages from previously pleasurable activities uh, oftentimes showing a shift of interest from like worldly interests, like sex, money, job to like spiritual pursuits. Um, that's classic uh, in, the, in, the, in the schizophrenia prodrome. And, and obviously you see that in the spiritual quest too. You have people like Francis of Assisi um, giving up their, you know, relatively cushy life for spiritual pursuits or, or Prince Siddhartha, the Buddha too, kind of had this nice life and all of a sudden uh, it's not, it's not worth it. I would rather pursue um, spiritual goals. Yeah. It's interesting um, as well on the mania side that like, given this seems to be the dopamine system, that that's goal directed. Right. And so with mania, you're very much the like, opposite. <laughs> yeah. It's the opposite. You're, you're going to work really yeah. hard on whatever your projects are. It's, it's, you're not going off and living in a cave. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, and both converge on this, on this common state of psychosis, which is dopamine driven. And um, the brain just gets so excited. It, it, it inevitably, not inevitably often ends in some type of extreme paranoia and disorganization. Um, so it does kind of converge on this common set of. Um, yeah. And paranoia seems to be, you know, what we were saying earlier, delusion to keep yourself feeling safe, coupled probably with the sense that, you know, you're stressed, you know, something's not right. So it makes sense that you kind of, you start to think, okay, so I've got to come up with a narrative that explains why I'm incredibly stressed. And actually, you know, instead of sitting with that stress and just, I, I guess we're not built to just say, I'm going to accept that I feel deep, deep kind of stress, probably from some, maybe some trauma or some, yeah, ambient stress you're not identifying. Instead, it's, it's easier to tell yourself a narrative that you're being followed by the CIA or whatever it is um, that your paranoia is. Absolutely. And you know, talking about evolved mechanisms is different here, but you can imagine um, in terms of vigilance, when people get very vigilant, um, the, the, the times naturally where you might reach a state of extreme vigilance and hyperactivity might be when you think other people are trying to trick you or deceive you, 
where there's some type of imminent kind of conflict that's kind of hiding beneath the surface. And so it, it, it this paranoia could build up, build on a, a mechanism which has evolved to um, kind of uh, investigate deception in other people and, and protect ourselves against that. Yeah. Right. And so something that's really powerful, I think, with, with this way of thinking is, you know, we now, we're, the field's moving towards a biopsychosocial model, right, of mental health, where there are these different kind of causes. You can have genetic components, biological components, but you can also have social stress and psychological traits. Um, and this is inherently a multi-level way of thinking, right? You're tying the experience all the way down to receptor level activity. Um, do you think that has a lot of kind of implications for how we might deal with something like psychosis therapeutically? Absolutely. Um, and I think it, it, uh, maybe the most relevant is, is, is understanding the, the social conditions that, that promote psychosis or psychotic like thinking. And I, I, I think preventing prevention is very key with, with psychosis because the difficulty is once, once the brain has gotten a uh, kind of a rhythm of falling into psychotic disorders when it, when it becomes hyper or psychotic episodes, once it becomes um, hyperactive is, is the solution to that is just to kind of maintenance dumbing maintenance, like reducing the excitation level of the brain, which is kind of your, it might be one of the only options um, once that pattern has established itself over and over again. Um, for, for some individuals. And so really kind of targeting uh, the environmental factors that might uh, promote um, psychosis in the first place. And I think, you know, here it's important. We're, we're talking about psychedelics here, but in, in terms of drug use in general, I mean, we know smoking cannabis is, is associated with increased risk of psychosis. So just being aware of things like the real kind of that's real persecution, alienation, social alienation is really increased, increases risk of psych psychosis. Doing all these things uh, together, I think is, is pretty important. Right. I mean, it also seems to offer a nice way to unify some traditions that have been very opposed where, you know, in, in the last few decades, you, you have the kind of, um, you know, pharmacological interventions only where you just have antipsychotics and you're trying to just suppress the symptoms. And then you have on the other extreme, you have the kind of anti-psychiatry movement of, of or like radical psychiatrists who would just allow all of the symptoms to come out and try to kind of support people in kind of as compassionate and supportive a way as possible. Um, and then given that this is a kind of multi-level approach, it seems to me that it allows you to really tailor to the individual and the context what needs to happen. You know, some people really may need that that sudden kind of pharmacological intervention to stop something really terrible happening. But other people maybe there might be circumstances where, you know, I think there are hospitals that are starting to do this in the, kind of some Nordic countries of not using pharmaceutical interventions and instead kind of allowing people to work through whatever the, psycho like the psychological material is that underlies the psychosis. Absolutely. And, and you can, you, there might be hybrids here that are going to work best. Um, I, I, I think immediately stopping a psychotic episode is not a bad idea just by kind of tranquilizing the brain or something. Um, but then when a person, they don't, maybe you work with the psychological material or work through the experience once a person's out of that in a, in a, in a, in a normal mind state. It's not, um, not necessarily the brain's become, is going to follow this enduring pathological problem forever that's it's not necessarily a fact but um yeah that's i mean and there's you know obviously there's there's people with much more expertise than me on the on, the, on this the topic of actual treatment and stuff so i don't want to you know, get too right yeah but, you know, prescribe <laughs> yeah but i think i think that's the nice thing with it is that it it um I see it as an opening up rather than a specifying this is the best way to treat people is instead it, it gives you a way of thinking about what preventative set, steps could we take you know i mean if we live in the culture that was so inclined we could take steps to reduce the kind of stresses that might lead people towards psychosis and i can see no 
no harms, you know, coming from, from that kind of approach. Absolutely. And I think also with, um, you know, the, the, the interest in, in psychedelics kind of overlapping with interest in spirituality, just, I think there could be, you know, just uh, maintaining a balance of how, how much you want to pers- pursue kind of spiritual thoughts or um, kind of hidden meanings um, and hidden realities and that type of stuff. Um, balancing that with kind of more emotionally just detached engagement with practical activities and stuff. I think, you know, just a, just like a, a nice understanding how certain trajectories of thoughts can predispose you towards yeah certain yeah. problems yeah that's something i'm hugely behind a kind of a healthy balance between the two instead of just trying to kind of transcend off into some you know negate all of your, <laughs> your what you are um yeah and i should mention before we uh finish that i think stan groff's ideas of um spiritual emergence seems to be a kind of nice parallel here the idea that psychosis can be understood as something similar to uh, a kind of spiritual experience or a, or a psychedelic experience um that can be can be supported in a similar way like we, we could have these synergies i guess between best practices in psychedelic therapy that could be imported perhaps into um into the kind of models for treatment of schizophrenia although i know you said you don't want to talk extensively on on, on the therapeutic side I'm, I'm i'm certainly not opposed I, i'm certainly not opposed to uh for, for for those discussions it's just you know yeah uh, yeah being responsible <laughs> not speculating <laughs> yeah well this has been great well i do i do a lot of speculation but as long as it's, as long as it does it's not a prescription <laughs> of course yeah <laughs> yeah this has been so good is there any way you would send people if uh, they want to look into your work i mean i guess the paper i'll put a link to the paper in the description the paper is a is a good one and i would also i have a 20 minute YouTube clip that I did with the um, sweet or Swedish psychedelic network, which I have written out where I describe uh, the pivotal mental state and spiritual experience and psychosis. And I think because I had it written out, it's probably a little bit um, clearer and goes less into the weeds about the receptors uh, than we did at at some points um, in this discussion. So uh, if you just look pivotal mental states on YouTube, um, go read the paper, and that's that's all I've got for now. So yeah, great. Yeah, I'll put those in the description as well. Yeah, this has been great, Ari. Thanks again. Thanks, James. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.